Now a House hearing on emergency room capacity and new Medicaid regulations. The witnesses are Health and Human Services Secretary Michael Levitt and Homeland Security Secretary Michael Chertoff. Henry Waxman of California chairs the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. This is an hour and 45 minutes. Meeting uh, will please come to order. <clears throat> Today we, will, we are holding the second of two days of hearings on the impact of the administration's Medicaid regulations on the ability of our nation's emergency rooms to respond to a sudden influx of casualties from a terrorist attack. On Monday we heard from the leading experts that the emergency rooms in our nation's premier trauma centers have little or no surge capacity. We learned from them that many level one trauma centers do not have the capacity to respond to a terrorist bombing like the one that had happened in Madrid in 2004. And we learned that the administration's new Medicaid regulations are expected to make these problems worse by cutting off crucial funding. The hearing left us with a number of important questions which we hope to answer this morning. Why would the Department of Health and Human Services, knowing that the nation's emergency care system is already stretched to the breaking point, withdraw billions of federal dollars from the hospitals that provide the most comprehensive emergency care to the most seriously injured? <clears throat> Why would the Department of Health and Human Services take this drastic step without first considering the impact of its actions on emergency preparedness or consulting with the agency with lead responsibility for Homeland Security? Why would the Department of Homeland Security, which is the federal agency with lead responsibility for protecting the nation from terrorist attacks, stand by while local emergency surge capacity is compromised? The impact of the Medicaid regulations on our health care safety net is not a partisan issue. Last month, Republicans in the House joined with Democrats in passing bipartisan legislation that would postpone the regulations and give Secretary Levitt and Secretary Chertoff an opportunity to reevaluate the implications for Homeland Security. The issue we're considering today is one that concerns all Americans, how to ensure that we have a robust response capacity in our emergency rooms. If the unthinkable happens, and we've learned that the unthinkable can happen, lives will be lost unless emergency care is immediately available. If a major city experiences a terrorist bombing like the one that occurred in Madrid, there will be a golden hour, an hour in which uh, the, the, the fate of those who are injured will be determined, whether the most severely injured survive or die. The federal government's job is to do everything possible to ensure that emergency care resources are ready during that golden hour. Certainly our government should not be taking actions that undermine the prospect of an effective emergency response. That's why we're having this hearing today and that's why I look forward to the testimony of the two men in charge, Secretary Chertoff and Secretary Levitt. But before we call on them, I want to recognize Mr. Davis for an opening statement. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. As you said, we are here today to discuss two issues, uh, Medicaid reimbursement regulations and the hospital surge capacity in response to predictable, some say inevitable, mass casualty events. And we are fortunate to have two very distinguished witnesses to inform our discussion. Welcome Secretary Levitt and Secretary Chertoff. We appreciate their taking uh, their valuable time to be with us today. As we learned from Monday's testimony on these same subjects, the nexus between Medicaid payments to hospitals and emergency preparedness may seem intuitive, but it is by all means, uh, it is not by any means proven. Extrapolating directly from daily emergency department utilization rates to catastrophic surge capacity overlooks complex and interrelated factors that differentiate single facility financial management from the broader resources needed to mount a coordinated regional disaster response. But extrapolate, the committee did, in releasing a one-day snapshot of hospital emergency room occupancy in seven major cities and concluding it painted a complete picture of surge capacity. 
Conflating the issues of Medicaid reimbursements and terrorism preparedness simultaneously oversimplifies and obscures both issues. I happen to agree with Chairman Waxman we ought to know more about the impact of the Administration's proposed regulation changes before exacting further cost savings from an already stressed health care system. But wrapping that issue in the mantle of terrorism creates the false impression solving the problem of emergency room capacity on Tuesday means we are ready for doomsday. It does not. As one peer-reviewed study put it, surge capacity planning involves ensuring the ability to rapidly mobilize resources in reaction to such a sudden, unexpected increase in demand, regardless of baseline conditions. It is just too simple and fiscally untenable to say there can never be cost savings in Medicaid as long as we are not ready for a Madrid-style attack. Both Medicaid efficiencies and preparedness need to be pursued, not one pitted against the other. So I hope we can move beyond limited snapshots and talk about the dynamic range of factors, in addition to baseline facility funding, that make up real surge capacity organization, leadership, standards of care, medical education and training, uh, interoperable communications, transportation coordination, and information technologies. Finally, we appreciate the fact our witnesses made a tough choice to be here today. As we speak, the Federal Government is conducting a national continuity of operations exercise, testing many of the response elements needed to treat a surge of trauma patients. I hope the exercise goes well in their absence and trust the Committee's approach to these issues will continue to be constructive and supportive of executive branch efforts to prepare the Nation for catastrophic events. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. Because of time constraints, uh, we will leave the record open for all members to insert an opening statement of the record, but we are going to go right to our very distinguished uh, witnesses, and we are privileged to have both very capable secretaries with us today with distinguished careers in public service. Secretary Michael Chertoff has served as the Secretary of Homeland Security since February 2005, and that capacity is a challenge. He has a challenging and critical responsibility to lead the Nation's efforts to prepare for, pr protect against, respond to and recover from terrorist attacks, major disasters and other catastrophic emergencies, whether man-made or natural disasters that affect our homeland. And before taking the helm at the Department of Homeland Security, Secretary Chertoff served as a judge on the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. Prior to that, he served as the Assistant Attorney General of the Criminal Division at the Department of Justice. Secretary Michael Levitt has been the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services since January 2005. As Secretary of HHS, he is responsible for managing a daunting array of medical, public health and human services programs. HHS is the lead federal agency for public health and medical preparedness and response. And before coming, before coming to HHS, Secretary Levitt was the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency. He also served as Governor of Utah for three terms, and during his 11 years as Governor, Utah was recognized six times as one of America's best managed states. We are pleased to have both of you here with us. Uh, um, I don't know which one of you wants to go first. Secretary Levitt, uh, your, both of your prepared statements will be in the record in full. We would like to ask you uh, to make your oral presentation to us okay. now. Yeah, good morning, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much, uh, Ranking Member Davis and the other members of the committee. I am very uh, pleased to discuss HHS uh, leadership role in the public health and medical emergency preparedness efforts, um, as well as HHS and CMS efforts to ensure that Medicaid pays appropriately for uh, services that are delivered to Medicaid recipients. As you know, uh, local, state and federal agencies have a shared responsibility for ensuring that the Nation is prepared for emergencies. In that context, permit me to briefly discuss a few of the emergency preparedness efforts that are currently being led by HHS. Uh, on October the 18th of 2007, President Bush signed the Homeland Security Presidential Directive uh, 21, or known as uh, HSPD 21. It established a new national strategy for public health and medical preparedness. Uh, HSPD 21 mandates the development of an implementation plan. HHS chairs the interagency writing team that drafted the implementation plan. It is currently in the process of being finalized. As part of the implementation plan, HHS is implementing uh, an emergency care coordinating center. This new center will serve as a coordinating focal point for emergency care uh, as an enterprise. The ECC, as we have come to know it, uh, charter is being finalized and we anticipate to have the center up and running by the end of this year. The National Response Framework Emergency Support Function, or ESF-8, 
uh, titled the Public Health and Medical Services uh, um, Function. Uh, provides uh, a mechanism for coordinating uh, federal assistance to state, tribal, and other local resources in response to a medical disaster. The Secretary of Health and Human Services leads uh, all of the federal public health and medical response to public uh, health agencies. The Secretary of uh, HHS uh, also coordinates through uh, his Assistant Secretary for uh, um, or ASPR uh, the, all of the ESF-8 preparedness, response, and recovery actions. The National Disaster Medical System, or we call it D, uh, NDMS, uh, transferred from the Department of Homeland Security to HHS, remains the tip of the spear, if you will, as the federal disaster health care response capacity. Over the past five years, the Hospital Preparedness Program has provided more than $2.6 billion to fund the development of medical surge capacity at the state and local level. As part of our pandemic planning, uh, we have asked grantees to report participating hospitals' ability to track beds electronically, uh, to report to the grantee's uh, emergency operations center within 60, within 60 minutes of a request. Uh, from 2002 to 2007, the, the uh, Public Health Emergency Preparedness Program has provided $5.6 billion to state, local, tribal, and territorial public health departments. This program has greatly increased the preparedness capabilities of the public health departments. Now turning uh, briefly to Medicaid, it's important to remember that Medicaid is fundamentally a federal state commitment to provide health care for Medi Medicaid beneficiaries. First and foremost, our responsibility is to assure that these low-income children, pregnant women, and people with disabilities are able to receive high quality and appropriate care when they need it. Uh, the, the package of recent Medicaid regulatory activity will help enable uh, or in, to ensure rather that uh, Medicaid is paying providers appropriately for services delivered as Medicaid recipients and that those services are effective and that taxpayers are receiving the full value of the dollars that are spent through Medicaid. GAO and the Office of Inspector General at HHS have provided policymakers with numerous reports on various areas in which states inappropriately engage in activities that maximize federal revenues. These rules address these types of abuses uh, head on. They address them by ensuring that the federal Medicaid dollars are matching actual state payments for actual Medicaid expenses to actual Medicaid beneficiaries. Medicaid is already an open-ended federal commitment to Medicaid services for Medicaid recipients. It should not become a limitless account for state and local programs and agencies to draw federal funds for non-Medicaid purposes. In conclusion, I, I have, uh, as I have mentioned earlier, HHS is working diligently to improve our nation's emergency preparedness and our medical surge capacity, and we have made extensive funding available to hospitals through states specifically to this, uh, to this end. Medicaid, however, is fundamentally a partnership that relies on both the states and the federal government to contribute their share of the cost of the program, allowing for the, continued, uh, for the continuation of abusive practices that shift costs to the federal government is not an appropriate way to ensure our nation's preparedness. We are committed through our emergency preparedness efforts to continue to make progress and to make funding available to states while acting through these Medicaid rules to provide greater stability in the program and equity to the states. And I want to thank you for the opportunity of being here to testify. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary Levitt. Secretary Chertoff. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Ranking Member Davis and other members of the committee. Uh, let me just take a few moments now since my, my uh, full statement will be in the record to put into perspective what the role of the Department of Homeland Security is with respect to the issue of preparedness and response, uh, one dimension of which, but only one dimension of which, is the uh, issue of mass care in the event of some kind of a terrorist attack or natural disaster. Let me also uh, underscore the fact that the planning and execution of a response to an attack uh, particularly with respect to the issue of mass care, would implicate not only uh, HHS, but would also uh, require the participation of the Department of Defense and the Department of Veteran Affairs. They have a major role to play in furnishing the resources and capabilities necessary to respond to a medical emergency, and their uh, capabilities are built into our plans, so it's not merely a matter of, of HHS. 
Basically, what I'd like to do is describe the role that we play in any kind of a response, and therefore, what role we play in planning uh, in the lead up to the possibility of a response. Uh, as you know, under the National Response Framework and the National Incident Management System, uh, the Department of Homeland Security plays the role of uh, incident coordinator, incident manager. That does not mean <clears throat> that we are exercising command and control over other departments and agencies. That would be prohibited as a matter of law. What we do do is bring to the table uh, the agencies that would play a role uh, there is a lead agency designated for particular functions in the case of mass care, it's the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, that is a, a designation that is both uh, prescribed by statute as well as by HSPD-5 and HSPD-21. Our role then would be to coordinate and deconflict uh, the various capabilities that we bring to the table and the roles and responsibilities uh, of the lead agency and other agencies. So that, for example, in the, in the case of uh, an attack, uh, let's say a conventional attack, we would obviously have to coordinate the law enforcement response, although the lead agency there would be the Department of Justice. There might well be a security response, in which case we would be coordinating with the Department of Defense and the National Guard. And then to the extent there was a mass casualty response, uh, the, the mission assignment for carrying that out would be to HHS, uh, but there would be support provided by the Department of Veteran Affairs and the Department of Defense. Um, this is all done under the uh, rubric of what we call Emergency Support Function 8, <clears throat> and the actual uh, undertaking would be coordinated through the National Response Coordination Center. As part of the preparation for this, uh, we engage in a variety of planning exercises uh, and with respect to the issue of mass care, again, we look to the Department of Health and Human Services to take the lead with respect to identifying what the gaps are with respect to uh, potential surge capability, uh, what the uh, available resources are, and what are the most efficacious way to provide those resources. Uh, that's done with the understanding that the initial response obligation lies upon state and local public health officials, and therefore they must participate in the planning uh, and it is their responsibility to make sure that they're pl they are planning in a way that is synchronized with us. We also recognize, however, that these capabilities would likely be overwhelmed in 24 hours or maybe 48 hours. And that's why we have capabilities such as the National Disaster Medical System, which is run by HHS, uh, why we would look to the Department of Defense to provide um, mobile field hospitals and other kinds of, of medical capabilities, which we would move into the arena uh, as quickly as possible. The National Guard would obviously play a major role. Uh, and again, if there were some particular issue like a chemical attack or a, a dirty bomb attack, there would be <clears throat> specialized capabilities by the military that would uh, be called into play. So that is the general role uh, that we play in coordinating these issues. Uh, we have engaged in planning, strategic planning, uh, on a number of scenarios, including some with medical dimensions, again, looking to HHS as the principal lead in identifying what the requirements are, identifying what, where the gaps are, uh, and uh, formulating a way in which those gaps can be plugged. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, without objection, we're going to begin questioning with 10 minutes uh, rounds, of <coughs> first controlled by the chair and secondly controlled uh, by Mr. Davis. After that, we'll go back to the five-minute rule. I'm going to start off the questions myself. Uh, Secretary uh, Levitt and Chertoff, we're here to answer the very simple question. If we had a terrorist attack, like what happened in Madrid, with conventional bombs or suicide bombers, which most terrorist experts say is most likely, not uh, the unthinkable weapons of mass destruction. But if the unthinkable, unlikely terrorist attack using conventional weapons occurred, would we be prepared to deal with it? Now, many experts have told us that if we had something like an attack on a commuter train where, as in Madrid, 177 people were killed and more than 2,000 were injured, we wouldn't have the surge capacity in some of our major cities to deal with those people in the level one trauma centers or even in the emergency rooms. Uh, Secretary Chertoff, do you think we have the capacity to deal with such an attack? 
I, I do, Mr. Chairman. Now, I want to, I want to note that uh, HHS is currently uh, engaged in a systematic survey uh, of capacities and plans across the country. So, uh, uh, you know, there's going to be a definitive answer to this, and there's no doubt some communities are better prepared than others. But I don't have to speculate about it. I remember we had a bridge collapse in Minneapolis some months ago. Uh, that was exactly the kind of event that, you know, you're talking about. It was not a terrorist event, but it was one which certainly posed challenges to casualties. And my understanding is uh, that in Minneapolis, things worked very well. We've had uh, well, only airplane. 13 people went to the emergency room well, under the, those circumstances. We could have hundreds, if not thousands, well, of people had, rushing had, into emergency had, rooms. We've had air crashes. We've had other disasters. Uh, I can't give you a uh, definitive statement with respect to a particular city. What I can tell you is I'm not sure that the day-to-day -day, uh, capacity rates of emergency rooms is a prediction of the capability of the emergency system to deal with a disaster. Because Have you delegated that to HHS in terms HHS of HHS has the principal responsibility. Principal I'm responsibility. You my understanding. Well, let me read to you what your chief medical officer, Jeff Rungi, told the House Appropriations Committee last month. He said, and I quote, I don't think anybody who has looked would be under the mistaken notion that we're adequately prepared for a hospital surge. We've squeezed all the capacity out of hospitals' budgets, and it's just not there, end quote. And he went on to say, quote, we frankly don't have a lot of solutions for it. Surge capacity does just not exist in the world of hospitals, end quote. Mr. Rungi did say the federal assets could be brought to the scene of a bombing, as did you earlier, but that could take some period of time, maybe a day or more, which may be too long for many critically injured uh, victims. So your own expert does not think we're prepared. Why do you disagree with Dr. Rungi's assessment? I, I, I wasn't here for the testimony. I think it depends on the number of people. If you, you know, there, there are, uh, I can certainly imagine a, an attack of a dimension that would overwhelm local resources. That's the very premise of what our position is with respect to planning. It's the recognition that the federal government would have to step in and surge. Um, what I, uh, and obviously, since we're doing a, a gap analysis, I'm going to be the first person to tell you that there are undoubtedly gaps that need to be plugged, uh, some of which are planning gaps and some of which are capability gaps. What I can't tell you is that this is simply a matter of emergency rooms. I think it's a much more complicated issue than that. But I, I will also you know, obviously acknowledge I'm awaiting to get more precision the results of the HHS study with respect to uh, you know, the, the country as a whole. Well, I don't doubt it's more complicated than one factor or another. But what I fear and what the experts told us a couple of days ago is if we go ahead with these Medicaid cuts, we're drawing billions of dollars from hospitals that have trauma one centers and emergency rooms, we're going to be making the problem worse. We're going to make it less, uh, less sure that we can even meet the response that we found so inadequate in our survey on uh, March 25th. Uh, at that time, the staff called Los Angeles and three other five level one hospitals that were so overcrowded, they simply shut their doors. And it wasn't even a terrorist attack. They shut their doors and said, divert these people somewhere else. In Washington, D.C., both level one trauma centers surveyed were over capacity and treating patients in hallways and waiting rooms. So if, if if in the middle of this inadequate uh, capability of our emergency rooms to deal with ordinary problems and we had a terrorist attack, I just think that if we go ahead with the billions of cuts in Medicaid funds for those institutions, we are making the problem worse. And the first thing at, at the federal level is at least not do any harm. Um, I think a lot of people are going to ask, how is it possible that six years since 9-11 Nearly three years after Hurricane Katrina, we spent billions of taxpayers' dollars on homeland security, and yet our emergency st systems uh, are not in, in place. Um, I don't doubt that you have very good intentions and a lot of helpful initiatives, but the problem is that positive effect of these programs, which involve grants of mil millions of dollars, are going to be overwhelmed when we pull out billions of dollars in some of these Medicaid uh, uh, cuts. 
we were told Monday that the Medicaid regulations will cripple hospital emergency rooms. The head of Virginia's emergency response program said you take away significant Medicaid funding, it's going to be disastrous. An expert from UCLA said the regulations would cripple emergency care in Los Angeles. Secretary Levitt, do you think these experts are wrong? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think we're dealing with two uh, fundamentally different assumptions, or uh, fundamentally different assumptions in two areas. The first is uh, the way surge capacity works, and that we would have to rely on hospitals uh, as the as the uh, the bed for surge surge capacity. And the second is that the mission of Medicaid uh, is uh, the the assurance of emergency preparedness. Uh, let me deal with the first one. Uh, surge capacity and the way it works. Uh, well, I'm, I'm sure asking you about the Medicaid, yeah. the Medicaid cuts by these new regulations. Um, I know we contacted you and your department, and we asked for every document that you might have that would indicate that you, um, uh, you did an analysis to find out what the impact would be of, uh, of these Medicaid regulations. And I think we might have even sent the same request to the Department of Homeland Security and we found that there was not a single analysis of the effects of the Medicaid regulations on our nation's emergency rooms. If that's the case, maybe we haven't received it, but if that's the case, no analysis has been done. I just think that's irresponsible. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, we have exercises on a regular basis, and the people from CMS sit at the same table as those from our Emer Assistant Secretary for Pre Preparedness and Response. Medicaid's mission, however, is not emergency preparedness. It is to provide health care to people, not to support institutions. Now at HHS we have a very important Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response who is tasked with that responsibility and we've made substantial investments in developing surge capacity. Did he do an analysis of what the impact would be of the Medicaid regulations that would draw money from these institutions? Uh, he manages emergency response, not Medicaid. The analysis on Medicaid was based on the fact that the, the, the funds were being drawn for purposes that we believe were inappropriate under the mission of Medicaid, which we believe to be helping people, not supporting institutions. Well, they, they, they help people by supporting institutions. Our public hospitals are absolutely dependent on the Medicaid dollars. They have so many people that come into emergency rooms that have no insurance, and the hospitals then have to shift the costs. And then if they find that Medicaid is not going to pay them for graduate medical education or other other functions that they serve, they, they just have to give up the expensive things like level one trauma centers. That's what they're telling us. But it looks like they never told you because they were never asked the question of what the impact would be with these Medicaid cuts. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it probably won't surprise you that I hear a similar uh, expression from those who run schools who say we need to have more money for our schools and if we can find a way to get Medicaid money to support our school effort, it'll help our schools. I hear a similar thing from those who run child welfare programs. If we could just get some Medicaid money, it would help us, and they stretch it over health care. Uh, Medicaid was not intended to be our emergency response mechanism. It wasn't we intended, but in fact it is. Secretary Chertoff, you're the head of the Homeland Security. You've designated this issue of health care functioning uh, uh, to uh, HHS, and yet they're saying that, um, that they, they don't know what the impact is going to be of these cuts. Look, Congress always holds hearings after the fact. After Hurricane Katrina and that disaster, we held hearings and we asked, how could this happen? This is a hearing to find out if we're prepared. I don't want it on my conscience, years after a terrorist attack, God forbid, that we uh, realized that we didn't do what was necessary because the bureaucracies weren't functioning the way they should. The planning wasn't taking place that there, were, there was money being withdrawn so that the whole system, which is all very fragile in this country for health care, wasn't able to function when it came to emergency care or preparedness for a, a, a surge of victims of a terrorist attack. I don't want in my, my conscience, do you feel that you can tell us today that your conscience would say that we're doing all that we need to do, Secretary Levitt, Secretary Chernoff? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I share with you the worry about surge capacity. It is a responsibility that I have and we have at HHS. I also worry about the long-term sustainability of Medicaid. 
Medicaid was not designed nor intended to be the, the source of money that we use to design an effective surge capacity strategy in this country. We do have a means by which that should be done. If Congress in its wisdom believes that more money is needed for surge capacity, we need to use the intended vehicle. We need to apply it to a logical, thoughtful strategy. That logical and thoughtful strategy will not include emergency rooms being the only place where surge capacity takes place. There's not an emergency room in America that you can't build a scenario for that will blow the doors off in a very short period so of time. So you feel good about the situation? No, I, that's not what I said at all, Mr. Chairman. I said I don't feel good about the situation, but I don't believe Medicaid is the way to solve it. And you think we ought to give other money, but we haven't been asked to give other money for this uh, purpose. Secretary Chertoff, how do you feel? I, I, I actually agree with Secretary Levitt on this. I think that I, I'm the last person to tell you I think we're done. I think that we are. Um, and you know, I've been involved in maybe more specifically looking at the issue of emergency response in, in the Gulf states. But more generally, I think we, we need to be uh, identifying gaps based on planning done at a federal, state, and local level. And then if we need to plug the gaps with money, the money ought to be targeted to plug the gaps. Where I'm seeing a bit of a disconnect is I have no reason to believe that giving more Medicaid money to hospitals is going to result in that money being spent specifically on those items which would be required to deal with a surge situation. Nor is it obvious to me that, that, that the only solution in a surge situation is the emergency rooms. So the question to me would be, do they need to have additional beds in storage? Do they need to have additional ventilators or medication or things of that sort? And if, in fact, there's a gap, that ought to be directly funded, but with the understanding that the money is going to be spent on those issues. I have no reason to believe that Medicaid funding in a hospital is necessarily going to be dedicated to emergency <laughs> response as opposed to something else. But a else. lot of it is being dedicated to I this now, and that money is going to be withdrawn, and it's a sizable amount of money. Uh, I've uh, taken up, uh, fifth, uh, let's see, I, uh, 13 minutes, and I'm going to give 13 minutes to uh, um, Mr. Thank Davis. you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Levitt. Uh, let me start with you. Thanks for being here. You know, regardless of one's views on the regulation, uh, I'm concerned about using Medicaid reimbursement to support emergency medical preparedness because it's an imperfect financial tool. In, in my experience, hospitals use additional revenues created through the reimbursement policy. They can be reinvested in ways that may not improve emergency capacity, as Secretary Chertoff just noted. For example, hospitals may more regularly reinvest in expanding capacity for profitable services orthopedics, for example. Do you think that additional Medicaid reimbursement necessarily results in improved emergency surge capacity? There is no evidence that it does. Thank you uh, very much. I mean, Medicaid is the fastest growing part of the Federal budget. It is the fastest growing part of State budgets uh, uh, as, as well. And to allow this to continue without tampering and looking at ways that we can improve service but at the same time cut back costs means there won't be money for a lot of other things in the budget uh, downstream. Uh, let me ask you this, Secretary Levitt. Uh, per the Homeland Security uh, Presidential Directive 21, it is my understanding that there is a stakeholder group that is working on the different financial uh, levers uh, available to improve preparedness. The group is looking at Medicare, Medicaid, private payer, grant funding, and market forces. How will this group's work uh, inform future funding decisions made at the Department? Uh, that group is looking at that question as well as many, many others to form this question. I, until I receive their, their report, I don't know what they will say. Uh, I think it is clear that Homeland Security is everyone's second job. We all have a primary job. The job of Medicaid is to take care of people who are poor or indigent or disabled. And um, we are, states are using ambiguities in the law uh, to try and tap that fund for many different reasons. Well, because it is the largest part of their budgets that and are growing. It just, and it, they've determined they've even in economic downturns when their revenues are less, their Medicaid costs are going up. In fact, uh, Mr. Davis, I would make the point that Medicaid is the single greatest influence on state budgets right now. I agree with and that. And if you uh, wanted to see why states were not investing and why they were looking for ways in which they could divert federal funds into schools and into child welfare and into public health and public safety, it is because Medicaid is pushing all of those things out uh, and, crowding, uh, and, and crowding them out. Their capacity to do that is being 
compromised by the fact that the program is growing so fast. And, and to understand this, I mean, 10, 12 years ago, it was really not a factor in state budgets the way it is uh, today. I was elected governor in 1993, and I would have to check this, but I believe it was in the neighborhood of 6 percent of the state budget. Uh, today, I, again, I would have to check, but I am guessing it is like every other state and that it is close to 20 percent. That right. means every, every, uh, every one of those dollars is crowding out education, it is crowding out higher education, it is crowding out public uh, response and preparedness, all of the things we are talking about. So in point of fact, uh, putting more money into this may have the opposite effect. Well, it, 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 it has had the yeah. opposite effect. Um, the uh, uh, Homeland Security Presidential Director 21 requires that the group review financial incentives uh, that uh, improve preparedness without increasing health care costs. There are economic reasons that hospitals have not increased emergency department capacity or the number of inpatient beds. Um, how does the health care, uh, well, how does the health system increase capacity without increasing costs? Well, I, I, I want to um, emphasize in this process the whole concept of all, uh, uh, of being, of, of all perils response. Everything we do to prepare, for example, for a pandemic helps us in, for a bioterrorism event. Uh, anything we can do that will use the same assets for multiple things allows us to expand capacity without expanding costs. The idea of sharing uh, assets, the way our surge capacity is designed to work, we know that there's, there is a scenario uh, for every hospital, no matter how big, no matter how well funded, no matter how sophisticated, that the capacity will exceed their ability to deal with that. And therefore, every hospital, every community needs to have a surge capacity plan that allows them to use schools that may in fact have been mothballed. Or you know, I've seen plans where shopping centers are converted into um, a surge capacity. I've actually witnessed during Katrina uh, convention centers being turned into hospitals and, and very good hospitals in the context of 24 hours. So surge capacity is about using existing assets to convert to uh, hospital capacity very quickly. It is not simply using the emergency room. If you were to look at any emergency room in this country, you would see that at least half of what is there I mean, at any given moment would not be considered uh, uh, absolutely critical. And if we turn into an emergency, those will be moved away or asked to be deferred and we will have substantial capacity that would not have been evident when the snapshot that was taken uh, uh, that the chairman referred to. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, let me just ask, I'd like to ask unanimous consent um, that a Wall Street Journal article of uh, nonprofit hospitals, once for the poor, strike it rich, be included in the hearing record. Without objection, I'd Thank you. Um, the majority staff report on the status of emergency departments looked at 34 hospitals and found that many were operating at or above capacity. Three hospitals were diverting ambulances, including one hospital that is undergoing a major expansion that includes the recent purchase of 3 million pounds of travertine imported from Tivoli, Italy, and 569 flat panel TVs. Another hospital that, according to the majority report, had patients in overflow spaces and borders has also undergone a significant expansion that included a new women's hospital uh, with marble in the lobby and flat screen TVs and birthing rooms. Both of these hospitals are nonprofits and it appears that they have sufficient resources to invest in marble uh, and TVs, but not enough to invest in emergency departments. Um, is this a, a, a typical and is this appropriate in your view? Well, it is not appropriate in my mind. I don't know how typical it is. I think the point you are making is a good one and that is that many times the lack of emergency room capacity is because the administration of the hospital has chosen not to invest there because it didn't, uh, in fact, assist their business model. And, in fact, by raising Medicare reimbursements and diverting that money to pay for marble floors and flat screen televisions really doesn't go anywhere to solve this problem, does it? I, you made the point earlier that there is no assuredness, no guarantee that money coming from Medicaid would be going into emergency preparedness and there is no direct link. So, so the question is, if we want to look at surge capacity, perhaps Medicaid isn't the best way to look at that. Uh, indeed, Mr. Davis, it is not. Uh, I want to emphasize I believe that there are deficiencies in our surge capacity. I just don't believe Medicaid dollars is the source of funds that uh, ought to be directed or looked to, to link to that solution. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Churchill, thanks uh, for being with us today. Uh, does uh, DHS have the expertise to determine the appropriateness of any of the following matters as it relates to Medicaid? Let me go through them. Whether public providers should be limited uh, to cost in Medicaid reimbursement. 
No, we rely on HHS. Well, for, uh, frankly, the whole issue of Medicaid is not actually within our purview. So the short answer is no, we don't have the expertise. Do you have the expertise to determine the appropriateness of the definition of unit of government for health providers uh, treating Medicaid patients? No. How about the appropriateness of graduate medical education payments in Medicaid? No. How about the scope of rehabilitation services? No. How about the appropriateness of administrative claims uh, for schools? No. Uh, the definition of the scope of outpatient services? No. The definition of the scope of targeted case management services? No. Thank you. Thank you. The national response framework encompasses a broad array of functions and, and entities. Correct. For example, transportation, communication, roads, utility, and public works infrastructure may all be heavily used in an emergency. However, these facilities also have important functions unrelated to disaster response or homeland security. Therefore, it seems imprudent to describe any service which might have a role in an emergency as a homeland security activity. How do you determine what functions are primarily related to homeland disaster compared to those that are uh, tangentially related? Well, I, I agree with you. The key for us is what is directly related. And, and the way we go about that is we put together a plan. We analyze what are the core capabilities we have to have to respond effectively. We then identify and survey whether there are gaps in those capabilities. And then we, f we determine what is the best way to plug those gaps. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chase. Thank you both for being here. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having this hearing. I, I am um, wrestling with the fact that I think we are really dealing with two issues. We are dealing with the health care issues that, uh, and the needs of our hospitals. And we are dealing with uh, a potential catastrophic event and surge capacity. So I would like to know from each of you um, who has the responsibility? First, is, is there been a study done that uh, looks at the entire United States to say how many um, uh, trauma one, trauma two, and trauma three centers we need and ideally where they should be located? Uh, Mr. Shays, um, with respect to emergencies, we are currently doing a, a, a study right now under the um, uh, uh, matter that was referred to earlier. Can you move the mic just a little closer, yes. uh, Governor? Thank you. Uh, we, we are currently uh, doing a study under HPS, uh, uh, HPSD 21, the group that was referred to earlier. However, I can also tell you that uh, we are asking and requiring grantees of HHS uh, for pandemic preparedness uh, to give us information about their surge capacity plan. Uh, between those two, we will have a very good idea in the future as to uh, what the capacity is and where our gaps are. Uh, I would also uh, like to make the point. And when do you think that would be done? Uh, we expect it to be done by the end of this year right. and uh, so that we can make the report before the end of the, the uh, conclusion of this term. But I would li I'd li I'd li I'd like you to know that we already have the capacity uh, at any given moment to determine where rooms and beds are available anywhere in the country within a, within a reasonably short period of time. Uh, during Katrina, I was constantly updated as to how many beds we had anywhere in a region that we could move patients to. And this is an important part of the way surge capacity works. We, we're discussing surge capacity today as though it were what you can put into an emergency room at any given uh, me, hour. Yeah, That's wanna, not the way surge capacity works. I want to make sure that my colleague, Mr. Issa, has some time. And I just would like a brief uh, comment from both of you as to who is ultimately responsible for this issue. Because it seems to me like when two people are, no one is. I think we would both agree HHS has responsibility for any matter related to uh, a medical response in a disaster. And so it will be your job, not uh, DHS, to determine how many trauma one, two, and three uh, units we need around the country? Well, it will be our, det our determination to determine how many we have, uh, what our gap is, and how best to respond to that. Thank you. Thank you. Governor, I will continue along that line. Uh, with. 259 trauma centers in the country, five in San Diego, four in Utah. Uh, it's very clear that in San Diego we have as much capacity for our two million people in a relatively small area as Utah has in a huge area. From all, from, from all practical purposes, for all practical purposes, in the case of 
disasters of any sort, take Northridge earthquake, aren't we essentially always assuming for Homeland Security that they are going to be in high risk areas? Well, ultimately, the people of Utah or Oklahoma or Wyoming could just as easily have a huge disaster affecting thousands of people over an area that could not possibly concentrate the types of hospitals that we have in Los Angeles or San Diego. So ultimately, isn't the planning for major disasters more about the essential planning and training and ability to move people than it ever will be about having operational extra spaces in one location? Yes. There is no one area of the country capable of handling their own surge in an event of sufficient size to require that kind of capacity. Mr. Davis, your time has expired. Uh, Ms. McCollum. Mr. Chairman, the report conducted by the committee highlights serious challenges confronting hospital emergency rooms. And crowding is a serious problem. The American College of Emergency Physicians released a report last month that addresses the crowding issue. Their report asks what causes crowding and it responds, and I quote, over the years the reasons for crowding have included seasonal illnesses, visits by the poor and the uninsured who have nowhere else to turn except the safety net provided by emergency departments. This country can continue to expand the capacity of emergency rooms to serve as a provider of last resort for the uninsured and the mentally ill. Or Congress can work to provide universal health care for all Americans. The choice is ours. Mr. Chairman, I don't know about the situation in New York, Washington, Chicago, Houston, Denver, or Los Angeles. I have never visited an emergency room in any of those cities, so I'll take this report's findings as accurate. But I live in Minnesota, and I need to set the record straight. First, the report inaccurately states that Minneapolis is hosting the 2008 Republican Convention. The convention will take place in St. Paul, Minnesota, my congressional district, with Minneapolis accommodating many of the visitors. This distinction is important, especially for the St. Paul officials, first responders, health care professionals involved in preparing to meet the needs of 40,000 visitors, including the President of the United States and the Republican nominee for president. Second, the report examines Hennepin County Medical Center, which is an excellent hospital and a level one trauma center located in Minneapolis. In the event of an emergency at the National uh, Republican Convention, Regions Hospital in St. Paul, an excellent facility, will be the primary uh, responder. With the hospital examined in the report providing support. What concerns me about this report is it examines Minneapolis solely as the presence of the National Convention, yet it evaluates emergency room capacity on a random day, March 25th, 2008. <coughs> During the four days in September when the Republicans gather in St. Paul, there will be a significant additional resources available to ensure a safe, enjoyable convention. There will also be an emergency plan and considerable assets in place to respond to any foreseen event. The Department of Homeland Security designated the National Party Conventions as a national special security event. This Congress appropriated $50 million to each host city to ensure coordination is seamless between Homeland Security, Secret Service, local and state law enforcement, and their first responders. Finally, while I fully understand the use of Madrid terrorist attacks as a standard for assessing casualty preparedness, real American tragedies like Oklahoma City bombing, Hurricane Katrina, Virginia Tech shooting, could also have been used as models. In the Twin Cities, we don't need to investigate emergency room capacity using a telephone survey. Our first responders were forced to respond to an emergency in real time. Only nine months ago, on August 1st, 
2007 at 6.05 during rush hour. Eight lanes of traffic on Interstate 35W. The bridge, it collapsed into the Mississippi River. That night, 13 people died, many of my constituents, and more than 110 patients required emergency and medical attention. The bridge collapsed due to structural failure. It just as easily could have been the result of a terrorist attack. But the disaster tested the very hospital in the committee's report. Hennepin County Medical Center and hospitals from the entire Twin Cities metropolitan area responded heroically, professionally, and efficiently. Their response was not a stimulation or a blind phone survey. It was real. And people are alive today because of that response. Mr. Chairman, I have statements from Hennepin County Medical Center, Regions Medical Center, St. Paul Chief of Police, the Minnesota Hospital Association, and there are more to come that I will submit to the record later. And I would like to have the committee's permission to uh, enter these uh, into the committee report. Without objection, that will be the order. The gentlelady's time has expired, and we'll <coughs> be pleased to have the rest of her statement in the record. Uh, Mr. Sully. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Chertoff, border security is an important issue affecting Idahoans, and uh, the need for secure travel documents, I, I think they consider equally as important. Um, do you have any security concerns specifically with the use of matricula consular cards, passport cards, Nexus and Sentry and FAST cards? Um, first, Mr. Chairman, I guess I do have to observe when I was invited here, I, I thought the topic was going to be um, medical surge. This is, it's hard for me to see the correlation here, so I have to ask you whether you want me to uh, answer this. Um, but if you do, I'll go ahead and answer. Well, the rules allow each member to ask questions. On so. any topic. Well, I, I, the short answer is I, um, I think that certainly our, our Nexus cards, our Sentry cards, our uh, Pass cards, which are about to be issued by the Department of State, are secure. And they reflect a um, uh, substantial step forward in improving the security of our documentation. Likewise, our uh, laser uh, border crossing cards. Now, the matricula consular is not an American-issued card, so I can't warrant or vouch for the security of that. We don't rely upon that for purposes of allowing people to come across the border. Um, well, I, th I think there is a relation here. I, I hear concerns uh, from many uh, areas of the country that uh, uh, part of the problem in hospitals is that they are overrun with illegal aliens in, in specific places. And uh, part of the uh, uh, problem, or dealing with the problem of um, illegal aliens is making sure that we have legal uh, ways for people to come to our, our country that are secure, in fact. Um, was there a, uh, a, a recall on the Nexus, uh, Sentry, or FAST cards uh, during the last year or two? Not, not that I'm aware. Mr. Sully, it's your time to ask questions, but you are off the topic for which we've invited the secretaries to, to speak, and I guess Secretary Chertoff will have to decide whether he's prepared to respond, but... Well, well Mr. Chairman... Uh, I could find out. I, said I didn't come prepared to talk about it, so per but I'm perhaps not aware of it. Perhaps the Chairman or the uh, Secretary would be willing to uh, respond to some of these questions uh, in writing sure. if I submit them to the, uh, the committee. And if I may continue, uh, do you do you share the concern that uh, the presence of illegal aliens uh, in our country is affecting uh, the ability of our hospitals to um, uh, respond in a surge situation? Uh, well, I, I don't know that I would connect it to a surge, but I, I, I would agree that uh, I'm aware that the presence of um, people who are in this country illegally does strain emergency rooms on a day-to-day -day basis because often these people don't have, uh, you know, health care through their employer, so they're relying on the emergency room as a kind of primary care facility. And that's one of the things we'd hoped to address when we took up the issue of comprehensive immigration reform, but as everybody now knows, that 
uh, didn't take off in the Senate. Um, so in the meantime, our, our approach is to enforce the existing laws as vigorously as possible. Um, Secretary Levitt, let me ask you the same question. Uh, do you share that concern about the presence of illegal aliens uh, overwhelming at times the, the uh, emergency room and hospital capabilities in our country? Uh, and uh, if you do, what, are you, what is your office doing to uh, 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 relieve that situation? Um, again, there's no connection necessarily between surge capacity, but there's little question that uh, many of those who go to emergency rooms uh, to be treated are here uh, without proper documentation. Uh, our department does provide substantial uh, assistance to hospitals to pay for those, but there's no question about the fact that it's a, a, a big part of the problem. How much does your uh, agency pay for uh, treatment for illegal aliens each year? That's not a, a number I have off the top of my head. Uh, it's a big number. You will get that for me, though? I'd be happy to respond in writing to the, to the degree that we have that information. I've, I've heard both of you say today that the presence of illegal aliens is not directly related to the surge, and yet both of you have said that uh, illegal aliens use emergency rooms as their primary care uh, doorway, if you will, into the health care system. But this is an um, important point, and I want to, I want to clarify it. Uh, in, on a day-to-day -day basis in an emergency room, there are many people who are there for what essentially could be a clinic, not necessarily an emergency. In such a setting, uh, they would be asked to take their health care problem or defer it for another time, and that capacity would be used for the surge. Uh, virtually any emergency room would have somewhere between 30 to 50 percent of its capacity used in that way. So when we say that they're overflowing, they're not overflowing necessarily with people who are in life and death situations. A surge capacity would clear those out on a, on a, in, in the kind of emergency we're talking about uh, to be treated in another way or on a different day. Gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Sarbanes. Um, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I just, on that last point, we had testimony on Monday that suggested that a relatively small percentage of the ED volume is from non-urgent kinds of uh, care. Uh, so I think that's a red herring. We're really talking about people coming to the emergency rooms uh, that need emergency care. We've had a number of hearings on the effect of these Medicaid regulations. Going back last year in June, we were told by a panel of experts that the emergency rooms are at the breaking point and the ability of emergency department personnel to respond to a public health disaster in severe peril. In November, the American College of Emergency Physicians said that if the regulations we're discussing today went into effect, the nation's, quote, the nation's public hospitals and emergency departments will sustain a devastating fiscal blow from which recovery may be impossible. And the National Association of Public Hospitals, and by the way, public hospitals are the ones that are really getting hit between the eyes. We had a we had a uh, description of a nonprofit hospital um, engaged in some purchases, which I'm not sure I would necessarily defend myself. But let's not get off on that tangent. We're talking about the impact largely on public hospitals, which are the ones that would suffer the most uh, from implementation of this regulation. Um, so I'm trying to figure out, and, and the, the Association of Public Hospitals said, quote, these regulations have the potential to devastate essential safety net hospitals and health systems in many parts of the country. So what is it that these experts uh, understand that the two of you don't understand about the impact these regulations are going to have? Mr. Starbanes, let me describe for you um, as a former governor what is happening with respect to public hospitals and where I believe we ought to be turning uh, to remedy this. Uh, it is not unusual at all, uh, well, in our public hospital setting, we agree to pay public hospitals an increment more than what we do normal hospitals. Uh, many states are taking that increment more and essentially taking it off the table, putting it into their general revenues, and then using that increment more to pay the match that they're supposed to be paying for Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, this is essentially a dispute between partners. Uh, we're saying to the states, we want you to put up real dollars, not our dollars recycled, so that you don't have to put up as much money. Uh, 
No one. Well, let me let me take that line of thinking uh, and move it slightly in a different direction. First of all, I want to challenge a, a premise that I thought I heard in your testimony uh, that perhaps hospitals are not at the center of any kind of disaster response. I mean, you talk about these other things, conventions being set up on a on a, a short-term basis, or schools, or so forth. But you'd both agree that when there's an emergency or a disaster, hospital emergency rooms are where people go, are they not? I mean, I, I represented hospitals for 16 years. Any kind of, any kind of disaster or, or occurrence in the community that created pressure, the first place they come, the first place they come, because they can't think of any other place to go, is to the emergency room. True? Mr. Sarbanes, there is no hospital in America that can keep enough spare capacity warm all the time just in case we have a major catastrophic event. Uh, and right, you can well, develop, you, no, you can develop you a question. scenario. You can yeah. develop a scenario that will blow the doors off any emergency room in America. The doors are the doors are already blown off. This is the thing. There's this notion that we're waiting for these surge situations. But as a practical matter, we've got a surge already. When you look at the boarding that's going on, the diversions that are going on, the fact that the, the beds in the hospitals for inpatient admissions are completely full, um, we're talking about a surge happening right now. Now, let me ask you this question. Um, if a hospital is underfunded, understaffed, and under-equipped in its main operations and main functions, is it better or less prepared for a surge, in your view? This question ought to be directed to those who administer and invest in the hospital. Most I'm of the just hospital asking your personal opinion. If a, if a hospital in its core function is underfunded, under-equipped, and understaffed, is it better or less prepared for an emergency and a surge? Obviously, they are less prepared. They're less prepared. Well, that's the situation many of the hospitals are in. So this, this fascinating, but I think largely false distinction between you know, funding that's going just for a surge as opposed to funding that's going to what Medicaid core functions should be, um, is, it's sort of a, it, 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 this is a red herring at best. And um, we've got to strengthen the underlying uh, core function and structure and infrastructure of our public hospital system and other parts of our health care system if we're going to be able to respond to this surge. Thank you. And we shouldn't be cutting money out of it if they're already not prepared to deal with problems. Mr. Issa, you're recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I certainly think that it's been good to wait a little while to go today because I think uh, uh, Mr. Sally's questions, although they seem to start on a tangent, finished uh, pretty cogently. Uh, Mr. Secretary uh, Chertoff, the link that you did agree to exist between our inability to either stop illegal immigration or the absence of their having an alternate insurance plan that would put them into normal front door of hospital and, and urgent care and other places rather than emergency room and trauma centers is a significant part of the overcrowding and the underfunding today. From your side, Homeland Security, you, you seem to very much agree that that is part of the problem that you face when looking at surge capacity today is can you get those centers freed up in time of emergency. So my question to you is, do you feel comfortable that even though a non-scientific partisan telephone survey uh, found that, lo and behold, these seven trauma centers were overcrowded on a given day, or emergency rooms, that those would be reasonably free upable for the kind of catastrophic emergencies we might have in the case of a dirty bomb or some other terrorist attack? Well, I, I, I agree with Secretary Levin. My understanding, of course, I'm, I mean, the expertise really resides with his department, but it certainly makes sense to me. My understanding is uh, that in a true emergency, people who are in the emergency room using it for primary care or for something less than an emergency would be asked to leave, and many of them would. I also agree with Secretary Levitt, there is probably some point at which no emergency center, no matter how well funded, 
is going to be able to handle what would be a truly mass event, and that's why we have these backup systems in place. There's no question that a catastrophic event is going to be bad. Uh, it's, ne it's not going to be pleasant, but I, I, I think that we would expect the emergency room to clear out all but the priority cases in order to handle the, the I, I certainly agree, and, and certainly there are doctors uh, who have been serving in capacities other than urgent care whose experience in surgery and other areas would quickly be brought in uh, post-triage to do it. Uh, Governor Levitt, uh, you know, the, the title of this hearing today I, I think is, is significant because it starts off and it says the lack of hospital emergency surge capacity colon will the administration Medicare regulations make it worse. Yesterday or day before yesterday I asked the panel who, uh, who all felt that overcrowding was a problem and so on, uh, but differed on whether they could handle emergencies. Virginia said we did handle emergencies. We believe we're well organized even here in the district. Well, other areas did not. One of the interesting things was I said, here's a billion dollars. How would you spend it? Would you spend it on training and preparation for an emergency or how else would you spend it? To a person, the panel said, I'd spend it on day-to-day -day routine costs. I'd simply absorb a billion dollars. Governor, certainly you have the background to understand that a billion dollars is a lot of money. But the cost of injuries in America today is estimated to be $300 billion in, in medical cost. A billion, two billion, three billion. If it is not used for preparation, training, emergency facilities and planning, will it even three or four billion dollars added into the system will it in fact increase surge capacity if it's simply spent on a daily basis? Uh, our significant concern with monies that we give to states is that they are focused on increasing surge capacity. We have put uh, nearly seven billion dollars through different departments other than Medicaid into emergency preparedness and specifically into right. surge capacity. And I believe that if we were to just be, if we were just to send Medicaid money, it would be absorbed into the, into the, into the hospital well, and, overhead. And Governor, following up because of the, the time is limited, um, essentially aren't we dealing exactly with that here today, that if in fact we don't carefully make sure that these funds do not get diverted and do not cover up for problems, including illegal immigration, to quote the other member, but, but all kinds of problems of the underinsured, aren't we by definition making ourselves less capable if we don't take action to ensure that it goes into planning and training and preparation rather than absorbing what clearly appears to be an everyday problem in America that was neither created by September 11th nor would be uh, rectified by a few billion more dollars here or there. Every community needs a plan, every community needs to train, every community needs to exercise, and that's what a, a, much of our money goes to and should. Governor, my time is short, but uh, you did deal with the problems of illegal immigration. You dealt with the problems of your emergency rooms and the impact of the underinsured. Isn't that a separate issue that we should concentrate on finding solutions for, but not mix it with today's hearing on surge capacity directly related to uh, uh, 9 11 type events? Uh, we have dealt with three specific and different issues today surge capacity, the impact of illegal immigration, uh, and Medicaid regulations. All three are separate, all three are important issues. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, it's time. Secretary Levitt, could you furnish for the record that how that $7 billion you claimed is going to uh, help uh, the hospitals? What, I, what I said, Mr. Chairman, was we have spent nearly $7 billion on local and emergency preparedness, including surge capacity in hospitals. And uh, certainly we can provide how that has been spent. And how much of that is for surge capacity? Uh, that is not a figure Well, I if have. you give it to us for the record, we would appreciate it. Uh, we now have uh, Mr. Murphy. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, uh, Secretary, Le Secretary Chertoff. Um, for the last four years before I came to Congress, I was the chairman of Connecticut's Public Health Committee in our legislature charged with this very issue of making sure that we had appropriate uh, surge capacity and everyday capacity in our hospitals. And, um, Mr. Levitt, I was reading through your testimony and uh, it is dazzling at some level the amount of bureaucracy and commissions that we have created around this issue, ACD, NBSB, ECCC, ASPR, NRF. Um, and I am sure these are worthy commissions. I am sure they are looking at important questions. But as somebody that was doing this on the ground floor, uh, this is all new to me. 
as a state policymaker, we knew that Medicaid was not just about supporting people, it was about supporting institutions as well. They're one and the same. You can't help people unless you have institutions that are there and willing to do uh, the work. Um, and, and so uh, the distinction, I guess, is a little bit troubling uh, to me. Um, but we also didn't know too much about these grants that were coming to us because uh, we really knew that in order to keep these hospitals up and running, in order to keep capacity uh, working, we needed Medicaid. We couldn't do it with grants alone. Uh, Mr. Levin, Mr. Chertoff, I just, if the staff has it ready, I'd like to just draw your attention to a chart. Um, and this, I think, gets at, um, I think this gets it <clears throat> at uh, Chairman Waxman's question about the amount of money that is going to hospital preparedness grants. Um, this is, uh, I think, a fair representation of over the last uh, several years, the amount of money that has been going into hospital preparedness grants, uh, starting at $498 million in 2003, dropping now to a proposed $362 million uh, in the proposed budget for the coming fiscal year. A pretty sharp decrease and $362 million over 50 states um, spreads pretty thin. The real, I think, rub here is when you compare it to the Medicaid cuts. If we can put that chart up now. Now, this is the grant money that states are getting, uh, 362 million proposed in the next year compared to the impact of the Medicaid cuts. Now, this is the state Medicaid director's estimates. Um, if you take the CBO estimates, uh, you're still talking about five times the amount of Medicaid cuts as you're talking in grant money to hospitals. And I think every state appreciates that grant money. Um, but it's a drop in the bucket compared to what hospitals are going to face with regard to these Medicaid cuts. Do you have, I guess I asked this to you, Secretary Levitt, do you have concerns that these grants, dwindling year by year, are going to be dwarfed by the size of these cuts? And though those cuts are going to obviously see their way through the entirety of a hospital's operation, no doubt much of it is going to end up in the emergency room. Uh, do you have a concern that, that these cuts, these Medicaid cuts, you say they're to support individuals, they inevitably have to support institutions in order to support the individuals are going to dwarf those grants? Uh, Mr. Murphy, the distinction on institutions and people is not one that we have arbitrarily made. It's in the statute. Uh, over time, states have inappropriately claimed Medicaid dollars in a number of categories which had a, a, the, the direct impact, I know you know this as a state legislature, of crowding out all of the other activities, including the development of public health and emergency uh, systems. Uh, Medicaid was not designed, nor is it uh, intended, to support institutions. Money should be directed to people. It, we support people. We support poor people, pregnant mothers, and the disabled. Uh, this is not intended to be a, a hospital entitlement. Now, I understand that they have come to rely on it in some cases. Uh, that's precisely the reason that we are pushing back to the fee-based consultants who are driving this uh, on the basis of their getting a piece of the action to push in Medicaid into every area of state government. It's not just emergency preparedness. It's in schools, it's in child welfare, it's in all the places that the states are not adequately funding, they're trying to get a garden hose into the Medicaid fund. But, but we're, not, we're not talking about those places today, we're talking about <clears throat> institutions that, we, that are indisputably linked to health care, which are hospitals. And the fact is, is that you say it's about supporting individuals, but the money doesn't go to individuals, it goes to institutions, it goes to doctors, it goes to hospitals, it goes to outpatient clinics, because we know we need those places up and running. And so let me just shift to, to a related question, and this is building off of Mr. Sarbanes' questions. You talk about the fact that ultimately this isn't going to happen in emergency rooms. If something enormous happens, you're going to have to build something outside of the emergency room. But doesn't that capacity, whether it exists in the physical confines of the emergency room or not, rely on the assets that exist right now in those emergency rooms. If we are, if we, if if we are gutting the capacity of hospital emergency delivery systems in terms of equipment, in terms of personnel, in terms of expertise, it seems to me, Mr. Levitt and Mr. Chertoff, that uh, this directly impacts your ability to then 
move that capacity uh, off-site, uh, even if it isn't on-site of the hospital grounds. Oh, this, again, a very important point, Mr. Mur uh, Murphy. Uh, we're bringing capacity in. In the first 24 hours of an emergency, we're dependent upon local assets. And that's where you clear out the emergency room. You take anyone who's non-essential and you or out of the hospital, you make capacity. Within 24 hours, we have the NDMS system there. We have as many as 6,000 beds we can bring from all over the country. Uh, we then go to another phase where we start taking patients into capacity. At any given moment, we know how many hospital beds are available in the area. We are not dependent upon the hospital facilities, except for that 24-hour period. And that's why we exercise and train uh, for all of the other aspects on surge capacity. And, um, and I appreciate that. I, I, I know enough about how these things work to know that they still do draw upon uh, local resources. They still do draw upon other hospitals, upon other capacity within the system. And as Mr. Sarbanes and others have suggested here today, we have maxed out both the emergency and non-emergency capacity of our health care systems to the point that that extra capacity, even in the 48 and 72 hour window uh, simply simply doesn't exist. Now, you can fly it in from all over the country, but I think this problem exists across the, uh, across the board. Our emergency medical technicians, our emergency <coughs> medical personnel um, are working 24-7 just to handle existing capacity right now, never mind being able to move over to emergency when it does happen. Uh, my, my time has expired, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Uh, Mr. Duncan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Levitt, uh, I've got to be very quick because they've got a vote going on, but uh, a few days ago we were given figures that uh, in the 10 years leading up to 2006, uh, Medicaid payments in Tennessee to Tennessee hospitals went up from $245 million to $607 million. And I, I'm sure that you have no idea what those exact figures are, but uh, do you think that uh, every state has, has received similar type increases, uh, more than doubling over the last 10 years? Uh, well, uh, um, states have clearly seen dramatic increases. We've seen a dramatic increase in the overall program. Tennessee may have been somewhat unique because of 10 care. And, and w would it be fair then to say that uh, in, in those 10 years, inflation has averaged around 3 percent a year, so those payments to hospitals have gone up many times above the rate, or several times above the rate of inflation. Do you think that's fair? Medicaid is growing at two to three times inflation. Two to three times the rate of inflation. So payments to the hospitals have gone way up over the past 10 years. The, the Medicaid money going to hospitals has dramatically increased over the last decade. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here today. Uh, Secretary Chertoff, I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, your role or involvement in these Medicaid rules that were, uh, were issued. In your testimony, you said that medical surge capacity is a critical element of our local, state, and national resiliency. But I don't see any evidence, I don't think we've been able to find any evidence of your department expressing any concern about these Medicaid rules uh, to anybody in that, and particularly with respect to the impact they might have on emergency rooms or the ability to respond to a, an attack or a natural disaster. Did you consult with Secretary Levitt uh, about these rules before they were issued? No, because I don't think that these Medicaid rules are particularly closely connected to the question of whether there is surge capacity uh, necessary to meet an emergency. So you were aware of them but just chose not to get involved, or, or you were only, I, uh, weren't even aware that they were being considered? I don't think I was particularly aware of it, nor would I, nor would I have expected to be made aware of it. Uh, we, uh, the staff interviewed Dr. Rungi from your staff, your chief medical officer. Uh, it's his role apparently to coordinate uh, between the uh, Department of Health and Human Services to make Correct. sure that, that, that hospitals uh, and the medical system are, pre are prepared for a disaster or for an incident. They asked Dr. Runge if, if he had reviewed or commented on the regulations and he also said he had no communications with anyone at HHS about it. And he said that there was no discussion even within the Department of Homeland Security about the rules. That's pretty consistent with, with your testimony as, as well is. on that. If he's supposed to be the point person for medical preparedness, I, mean, I just don't understand how he completely ignores rules which are certainly going to have some impact, or is it your position they're absolutely going to have no impact at all on emergency rules? Here's, here's where I think we're having some disagreement. 
everything has impact on everything. So in some sense, the economic health of the country has an impact on, on homeland security. But if I use the logic, that logic, I would be involved also in the subprime mortgage crisis because that affects state budgets. I'd be involved in gas tax and gas, uh, gasoline prices because that has an impact. I, I mean, that's even for a department which has sometimes been accused of having too broad a mandate. That goes several bridges too far. Our focus with respect to, to uh, working with HHS is to assure that there is a planning effort underway, that we are identifying gaps, and that we are coming up with specific measures that will plug the gaps. And I, I have to say, I agree with Secretary Levitt. I don't think that Medicaid funding and reimbursement rules um, have anything more than a, a very indirect connection with this issue. And if I allowed, if I took the position that every indirect impact on Homeland Security made it my business, uh, we would become the Office of Management and Budget instead of the Department of Homeland Security. Yeah, I, I do think there's a disconnect between what we're talking about here. I, I have a difficult time thinking that you don't see a more direct relationship between the status of our hospital's capacity uh, in the emergency room's capacity to deal with these things in a mortgage. I, I, that's, I, that's a I, bit of a difference there between the two, and I would hope that you get that distinction. I, I think that I, I, no, I don't say that I, that I'm, I don't think emergency care and, and the health care system isn't more connected. I think that Medicaid reimbursement, which is not specifically targeted to putting money away for emergencies, uh, is, uh, I think, uh, several degrees of separation from the kinds of much more specific issues that we're spending, uh, we're focused on in terms of getting ready for emergencies. But I find it interesting that your department didn't even look at the prospect that reducing Medicaid funding might have an impact on hospitals' overall operation, including uh, the impact on emergency rooms and capacity in case of a surge or incident. But I, mean, I would think that that's the type of thing that, that you're assigned to do and, and Dr. Runge is assigned to do, um, to at least raise the issue and think about it and, and move on from there. You know, the staff asked Dr. Rungi how he justified this lack of communication with HHS about the rule. What he said is, you know, we're threat he, his quote was, we're focused on threats that can kill hundreds of thousands, not hundreds. A little insensitive, I would think, to no, I, I think on that. I, well, I can't, I, I wasn't there for the interview. I can't read his mind, but I think what he was trying to draw a distinction between is the, you know, very real issue of day-to-day -day capability of the medical system to deal with day-to-day with -day kinds of issues, which is a perfectly important and, and significant matter, but not one that falls within the purview of my department, as compared to dealing with the issues that do rise to the level or do specifically involve homeland security, like a pandemic flu or a major uh, catastrophe, where the, the, we do focus on the issue of surge, but our, our main focus is on those matters that have a direct relationship. Are we stockpiling enough? Do we have a plan? Do we have a delivery mechanism? Do the localities have a plan? And there we do interface with HHS. Uh, not only Dr. Rungi, but I personally talked to Secretary Levitt about these issues. But, but much more tightly related to the specific need to have an emergency preparedness capability than Medicaid funding, which has to do with the overall economic health of the medical system, which is frankly a much broader issue than my department's uh, focus. Well, I guess it could be seen that way, but it could be narrowed down to think that when there's a serious, severe cut in finance that's going to affect the operations of a hospital, including those that you're directly concerned with, <coughs> I would like to think that your department gets involved at that capacity. It's not indirect. That's pretty direct. But my time is up, and I get back. Gentleman's time has expired. Ms. Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank both these witnesses for being here. Um, and I particularly am grateful for this hearing because I'm afraid it's uh, I'm more deeply implicated than some because of of my representation of the District of Columbia. I've worked closely, of course, in my work on uh, the on the Homeland Security Committee with Secretary Chertoff and. Um, uh, Secretary Levitt, I worked with your predecessor on something called ER1. I, I, I am particularly concerned uh, about this place, not only because I represent 600,000 people here, but because all of official Washington is here, 200,000 federal workers, and because this is a prime target for terrorism. Um, this, this discussion about trying to separate out Medicaid from 
other money is important because we want money used for what is intended, but you certainly can't treat a hospital as if it were not an organism with core functions that treat medical, private and uh, poor patients alike and as if you could collapse the part that treats Medicaid patients. And I think that's what some of us have been trying to, to get at. I want to ask you about the hospitals here. We've got three um, uh, trauma centers here. Um, two of them were were surveyed in this survey, and they were uh, extensively above capacity. No available treatment spaces in the hospital. Only six had intensive care unit beds. Uh, one could not participate in the survey because it was so overcrowded that it had stopped taking, accepting new patients uh, at, at all. Um, my good friends on, on the other side of this day a site, the Washington Hospital said the emergency room as a, as a model for the country. It is uh, a, very good, a very good emergency uh, room, but I, that's what I've worked with on so-called ER1. I'll get to that in a minute. But since they cite the Washington Hospital Center, I went to the um, head of the emergency room, Dr. Mark S uh, Smith, and Dr. Smith confirmed the findings of the survey and in addition said, um, and well, he said he had twice as many patients as, as he did treatment spaces. Uh, they're putting them in the corridors, in administrative offices. Uh, they, they, are, they, they are putting them in waiting rooms. Um, and he said he had a major problem with preparedness. Now, he, I understand triage. I also hope we don't ever be, uh, we're not ever in the position where, of, of what I would, w w would, would believe would be uh, chaotic triage if, if everybody surged in one place. So for that reason, here in the, here in the um, nation's capital, I've been working with the administration. Actually, we've almost gotten it through several times on at least one hospital that would have surge capacity so that everybody would know in advance that don't, don't put all these federal workers uh, close to the nearest hospital. This is the one that, that is prepared. It has huge capacity. It would have a huge capacity. A lot of private money would go into this, some federal money. Um, now, my question is this. If you cut billions of dollars of, of a, what amounts to safety net funding from hospitals. Uh, you're also including these trauma centers here in the nation's capital. Can you assure this committee that even with such uh, very um, severe Medicaid cuts, the hospitals in the nation's capital are prepared for a mass event here and to accept patients in the event of a mass event here. And I would, I would further ask uh, Secretary Levitt if he supports uh, ER1. First, I want to note, are you, are, are you saying to this committee, in the face of the survey that you are aware of, that in the event of a major or mass event here, that the hospitals, even with the cuts, that are on the table could, in fact, manage that event. Uh, Ms. Norton, I will uh, tell you uh, that the Washington, D.C. area <coughs> engages in regular planning exercises, I think, as well as any place in the country. Now, I want to restate, uh, am I saying that surge capacity is acceptable everywhere in the country? No. I'm not asking about, I'm asking about the place where members of Congress, uh, the President of the United States, where members of the Cabinet, where 600,000 residents here, where 200,000 workers here, uh, I'm, I'm at three trauma centers. I'm being very specific. I'm not focusing on elsewhere. I'm focusing on target number one. Uh, I am not. Can I, you say you're prepared? I am not the person to answer that. The person in my department would be Rear Admiral 
Vanderwagen, who was not invited to the hearing today, and I'm sure he'd be happy to meet with you and give you his reaction to the preparedness of. I have to, I have to, uh, to indicate that, that as the secretary, I would think that you would know whether or not the nation's capital is prepared for. Well, I, I live here just like you do, event. and I'm anxious for that. And to that be troubles the case. me both as a member of the Homeland Security Committee and as a member of this committee that you cannot answer that question. Do you support ERA, ER1 surge capacity? Uh, is this the project at George Washington? Uh, this is a project at uh, Washington Metropolitan, uh, Metropolitan Washington Center. Uh, I am aware of the project by title. I, I do not know enough about it to respond at this hearing. If you'd like, I'd be pleased to respond to you in writing. I very much appreciate it. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Norton. Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> uh, Secretary uh, Levitt, uh, perhaps the thing that most confuses me about your actions is why you did not consider the impact of your Medicaid regulations on, em on emergency preparedness. Last June, the committee had a hearing on the state of emergency medical care in the United States. At the hearing, concerns were raised about the effect of the Medicaid regulations on hospital emergency rooms. As a result, the committee wrote to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to ask whether CMS, which issued the rules, had consulted with the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness who is the official in your department in charge of emergency response. Astonishingly and unbelievably, CMS responded that it, and I quote, did not specifically request input from uh, the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Preparedness for Preparedness because that office is not likely to have expertise in Medicaid financing, end of quote. The committee wrote you again in November. In this letter, the committee specifically requested, quote, all documents relating to the potential impact of the Medicaid regulations on emergency care and trauma services, end of quote. In February, the Department responded to the committee's request. I want to read you, to you from this letter, and it says, the Department, quote, the Department has not found responsive documents, end of quote. According to this letter, your staff searched for responsive documents in five different parts of the Department the Office of the Secretary, the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness, the Health Resources and Services Administration, the Centers for Disease Control, and CMS. Yet not one of those offices had done any analysis of the impact of the regulations on emergency care. Secretary Levin, how can you possibly explain this? Hospitals across the nation are telling us that your regulations will devastate their emergency rooms, yet you did not even consider this issue according to what I just read. The rule change we're proposing is not about surge capacity or hospital health. It's about states who have been claiming inappropriately funds that they're using to recirculate to pay their, their fair share with federal funds. Uh, Medicaid is not a program to support hospitals. Medicaid is a program to support people who are poor, people who are pregnant, or, and people who are disabled. Uh, it was not intended, nor is its purpose, uh, should it, nor should it be managed, uh, to be the source of funds uh, for surge capacity. Now, let me just go a little bit further. You, you were specifically asked to consider the impacts of your rules on trauma centers and emergency rooms. Over a year ago, Chairman Waxman and over 150 other members of Congress wrote to you to urge you to consider these issues. Let me read uh, to you from your letter in response. Quote, we are right, no, our letter. We are writing to request that you withdraw the proposed rule. The proposal would threaten the capacity of safety net hospitals to deliver critical but unprofitable services, such as trauma centers, burn units, and emergency departments. Yet, still, you prepared no analysis. This appears to be a case of willful blindness. Perhaps it would be better stated if I said it appears to be eyes wide shut. It seems that you're deliberately ignoring the impacts that your rules will have on the emergency care and preparedness in our nation. That's irresponsible and, to be frank with you, is quite dangerous. Secretary Le Levitt, the preamble to the proposed Medicaid regulations read, and I quote, with respect to clinical care, we anticipate that th this rule's effect on actual patient services to be minimal. While states may need to change reimbursement or financing methods, we do not anticipate that the services delivered by governmentally operated providers or private providers will change." End of quote. In response to these regulations, your department received over 400 written comments, 
all of which express opposition to the rule or to portions of the rule. And I would I'd like to read just a sample of one of those. And it's from the Society of Academic Emergency Medicine. And it says, quote, this proposal will jeopardize the viability of public and other safety net hospitals. It will also jeopardize the viability of our emergency medicine uh, treating teaching programs, which has long reaching downstream effects on the quality of emergency care in this country. We believe that Medicaid cuts of this magnitude uh, projected under this proposed rule will adversely affect access and the viability of our nation's safety net providers. And so I'm just wondering, uh, do you have a comment on that? Yes, I do. Uh, this rule is about states not paying their fair share, and it's a, dis a dispute between partners. We are mutually committed. If states will step up and do their share, we will ours. But this is about paying for people, not for institutions. This is not, this is, this is, we're following the law. We're trying to push back where people are, or states and other programs within state governments are trying to make up for deficiencies that have occurred in state governments by tapping Medicaid funds. And someone needs to do it because the Medicaid program is unsustainable in its current course. I made the point earlier. Many of the programs in states are being crowded out by Medicaid. And it's being crowded out because we continue to use it for virtually every aspect of state government. Anyone who in state government who thinks they can find a, 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 some connection to Medicaid is attempting it. And we have to do this in a way to keep the integrity of the funds so that we know we're paying for, what, for health care for people, not for institutions, and we're I, not making up for states who aren't doing their share. I see my time is up. Secretary Levitt, with all due respect, I think you're ignoring reality. You're saying that you want to cut back on a system uh, that's uh, getting federal dollars inappropriately and they should make up the money at the state and local level. They're not going to be able to make up that money at a recession. Uh, the income is not coming into the states. And you never asked your partners, the states, what the impact would be to make these kinds of withdrawals of the federal share of the Medicaid funds that go to the institutions, especially public hospitals, that are funded exclusively by the taxpayers. It, at the minimum, I would have thought that you would have wanted to ask the question of what the impact would be so you would know. You insist that that's not going to have this kind of impact, yet when you put out your rules, the Society for Ac Academic Emergency Medicine said, this proposal will jeopardize the viability of public and other safety net hospitals. It will jeopardize the, vi jeopardize the viability of our emergency medicine teaching programs. Uh, Parkland Hospital in Texas said they receive Medicaid payments of $90 million annually and that without this funding, Parkland may be forced to drastically scale back their services in the uh, Trauma One Center, uh, the Level Trauma One Center. Uh, you've got all these others, the President of the University of California, the University of California Academic Medical Centers. You've got all these comments and we looked at the review, the rulemaking record. The fact is, you ignored these comments. You didn't adjust the policy in response to these comments in the final rule, and you did prepare an analysis to the effect that the Medicaid regulations would be minimal impact on care that being provided by the states. How can that be? Isn't that irresponsible? Uh, Mr. Chairman, it is responsible for me to follow the law and assure that the states are doing their job Otherwise, we're not being a wise steward of limited Medicaid funds. This is a dispute between partners, between the federal government and the states. And the federal government is saying, you can't take money we've given you extra for these hospitals, put them back into your general fund, and then use them to pay your share. Just give us real money, give us value, give us uh, for, for real patients. Uh, this is not about surge capacity. It's about a relationship between the states and the national government. But I the consequences will be the, well. And the I'm consequences will be the institutions that provide the safety net to the very poor in our society will not be able to continue to function and provide those services. It just seems to me you're, you're, you're judging your actions on an ideology without having established the record. You didn't come to Congress and ask for those changes. You're trying to put them in effect, into effect on your own. Fifty governors have asked us to at least put a halt on this so they can be studied, which they should have been studied before they were uh, put into place. Uh, overwhelming majority of the House of Representatives has put a hold on these 
regs until we can look at them further, uh, I think that uh, you ought to withdraw these regulations and let's see what the impact will be. Let's know that we're not doing any harm to the ability for hospitals around the country to deal with the problems that they may face, not just day to day, but in a, in a, um, a terrorist attack. It is not surprising to me that you can unite 50 governors around the proposition that the federal government should pay their share. Uh, and that's essentially what this amounts to. Uh, many states have improperly used money that has come from the federal government for the purpose of supporting the hospitals we're talking about, have taken it off the table, and then used it to pay their share. This is about states not paying their fair share. And I would think we would all be united in saying if we're going to have a partnership, then everyone ought to pay for I think real dollars, for real value, for real patients. But did you consult with Secretary Levitt to tell him that there may be some impact in, around the country and the ability to deal with it, a, a terrorist attack? Uh, this is a dispute between the federal government and the states on Medicaid financing. You it didn't, not you didn't inform Secretary Chertoff of uh, we, we, re we regularly consult on the larger strategic issues related to uh, our joint mission. Did you this do is not one of them. Did you do an evaluation to know what the impact would be on these hospitals if these regs went into place? Medicaid is not intended to support institutions. It's intended to support people. But it does support these institutions because people without insurance go to these hospitals. People who are injured go to these hospitals. If you withdraw the money from the hospitals because you have a theory that the states ought to come up with more money, it means, as we were told by Dr. Roger Lewis, who is an emergency room physician at UCLA, a nationalized recognized expert in hospital emergency preparedness, he said, those of us who work on the front lines of the medical care system believe it is irrational that an emergency care system that is already overwhelmed by the day-to-day -day volume of acutely ill patients would be able to expand its capacity on short notice in response to a terrorist attack. He said if a bomb went off in Los Angeles and injured hundreds or thousands, L.A. would not have the emergency room capacity to care for the wounded. In your statement to the Congress, you uh, emphasize the support the federal government is giving states and localities to improve this emergency preparedness. And we asked Dr. Lewis and he said, well, they were getting $433,000 in a preparedness grant. He was very grateful for it. But the cost of these Medicaid changes would mean they would go without $50 million. And he said that's 100 times more than the Medicaid cuts uh, uh, they would get on these preparedness uh, grants. And they're going to be in very, very sad shape. Do you take what he had to say seriously? Do you think he's just fronting for the states because they want to rejigger their money around? Mr. Chairman, over the course of the last three years, I have been in virtually every state uh, and met with the emergency community and ha the record is replete with my statements of concern about surge capacity. Uh, it is not at the level we want it to be. We have many areas in which we can improve. But Medicaid is not the source of funds to do that. If the Congress of the United States views that there is a need for more dollars, we have ways in which we can funnel directly <coughs> to the hospital funds that are necessary to improve their surge capacity. Medicaid was intended to be for people, not for institutions. And every institution I know would like to drag a garden hose over into the Medicaid fund and be able to tap it because their fund isn't what they'd like it to be. We need to be disciplined. We need to assure that these re uh, disputes are, are, are resolved between the states and the federal government so that we're, we have a true partnership, not just one that relies entirely on the federal government. Well, uh, I must say with all due respect, your actions make absolutely no sense. The tiny grants you're giving to hospitals can't possibly offset the impact of cutting billions of dollars from those programs. We've, uh, I must say, as we conclude this hearing, I find it very discouraging. We know the nation's emergency rooms are already at the breaking point. We know a terrorist bomb bombing is a predictable surprise. We know that local emergency room capacity is critical to saving lives in that golden hour following an attack. We know that public and teaching hospitals operate many of our nation's most critical emergency rooms and trauma centers. We know that the Medicaid regulations will reduce funding to these institutions by hundreds of millions of dollars each year. We know that these cuts will further undermine the ability of these hospitals to respond to a terrorist bombing. 
We know that these regulations will go into effect in three short weeks. And yet the secretaries that are in the position to avoid this harm will not take any action. And I think it's regrettable. I, I, I must say this is not just a disagreement. I think it's a substantial breach in uh, what I think is our mutual responsibility uh, to make sure that we can deal with the homeland security uh, attack which could amount to a tragedy. I thank you both for being here and we hear the bells, there's a vote on the House floor. Uh, I do want to ask unanimous consent that the record be held open for members to ask further questions and get response in writing. We stand adjourned. C-SPAN's 2008 Congressional Directory is ready to order. Over 200